Luke chapter 18 is where we are, and if you're visiting with us, we're going through the Gospel of Luke on Sunday mornings, and we're in verse 35 through verse 43 this morning. Luke 18, verse 35. Then it happened that as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before him, those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Lord, we also give praise to you for the fact that there are many miracles sitting in this sanctuary today and perhaps watching via the internet. We pray that lives would be affected today in a meaningful way that would advance growth in the grace and the knowledge of God and that the Lord Jesus Christ would be magnified and glorified. We ask for the Holy Spirit of God to be poured out upon each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Verse 35 says, Then it happened that as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road begging. The words, then it happened, really are merely words that help us understand that what had happened in the previous record here in Luke is now transitioning. It's just a word that's saying, well, something on a certain day happened. But what happened on this day was something that the blind man did not expect to have happened to him. I love the fact that it says, then it happened. And I would like to suggest to you that before this service is over, you might have a testimony as you leave here today and say, you know what? Something happened today to my life. And I pray that that will be your testimony. But as he, Jesus, was coming near Jericho, he had been up in the Galilee, northern area, moving towards Jerusalem, as he had mentioned earlier back in verse 31, were going up to Jerusalem. They were coming to that little, to that city Jericho, which still exists today. It's ruins anyways. That there was a certain blind man. He sat by the road begging. Now in this text, we're not told anything else about him we're not told his name, we're not told his age, we're not told if he had family members, we're not told how he would arrive at this particular location, who may have brought him there day by day. We, we know nothing about him except that he was a certain blind man, that he was sitting by the road, not on the road, but 
what would be essentially the curb, didn't exist, but on the edge of the road, and he was begging. Now, if you will, bear with me for just a moment. If you'll take your hand and put it out in front of you and just look at it for a moment, and you can see your hand, and then if you'll just close your eyes for a moment, you can't see your hand anymore. That is the physical condition that this man was in. He couldn't, he couldn't see anything around him. If you open your eyes, his eyes later got opened. But what a condition this man was in. And we're going to talk in just a few moments about why it is that some people are blind to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But picture this man begging. He may have had his hand out, may have been talking. Uh, we don't know what his face looked like. He certainly wasn't wearing Ray-Bans to cover up his eyes. Uh, he could have had disfigured eyes. They could have been horribly disfigured or Maybe he didn't appear to be blind, but was. But he was sitting there begging. And then the next thing that's said about him in verse 36, and hearing a multitude passing by. We don't know how big the group was, but the word multitude means that it was a pretty big group. We know from the Gospels that wherever Jesus went, he was uh, thronged by large groups of people. There could have been hundreds, if not thousands of people, or there could have been maybe just a hundred. But it was a large group of people. They were passing by, so he could, he could hear the people talking. He could hear their sandals on the road. He could hear movement of their uh, clothing and other things that they were holding and, and uh, just all of the sounds that one would hear of people passing by, and so he asked, hey, hey what's, what, what, what is this? What, what's going on here? Because it was unusual to have a multitude of people walking along. I mean, a few people, yeah, but a multitude, something's happening. And when you see a large crowd of people gathered together somewhere, you, you want to know what's going on because it's unusual. Verse 37 tells us that this unnamed group of people told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Jesus of Nazareth. And implied in this text and in this story, and it's reasonable to assume, and the text I think really does confirm it, that when he was told that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he had known about Jesus of Nazareth. The whole land heard about him. This man would have known that Jesus of Nazareth was not just any old guy from Nazareth, but this was Jesus from Nazareth, the one who brought healing to many, many people, cast out demons, evil spirits, raised people from the dead. He would have known that. So in verse 38, upon being told that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he cried out. And when it says he cried out, he didn't just say, Jesus. He cried out. He, he passionately cried out. He'd want to be heard. I mean, he's sitting down. There's this multitude. There's this all this noise. He cried out saying, Jesus... He's trying to get Jesus' attention. Jesus, he called him son of David. Another indication that he understood a little bit of who Jesus was. And then he made one request of him. Notice at the end of verse 38. Have mercy on me. I don't know if the man became blind because of some sexually transmitted disease. I don't know why he used the term mercy. Perhaps he merely understood that God is merciful. His mercies are new every morning. He may have been familiar with the Psalms which speak of the long-suffering of God, the mercies of God. Mercy means 
getting what you don't deserve. He may have no doubt fully understood that he didn't deserve any blessings from God based on who he was, based on how he had lived. Would you have mercy on me? I'm asking you to have mercy on me. Then, oddly enough, notice what happened in verse 39. Then those who went before, now we're not told exactly who the those were, but it's safe, I think, to assume it could have included the disciples. And you say, why do you think so? Well, look what they did. They warned him that he should be quiet. Now, a couple of things here. The disciples were known for not being real sharp about what Jesus was wanting to do. Sound familiar? Do you remember when people were trying to bring their children to Jesus to be blessed? What did the disciples tell the parents? Hey, leave him alone. I mean, they, they may have meant well, like don't bother him. You know, that's Jesus. He's busy. And Jesus said, no, no, no. He said, let the little children come to me, for of such is the kingdom of God. He said, it's, it's people that have childlike faith are in the kingdom. Let them come to me. So it may very well, this group called those, may have included the disciples. And if it did, it's sad, but it can be perhaps a reflection of you and I. Imagine these people having no care for this poor blind man. In fact, they warned him. That means they were threatening him. We're not told what the threat was. We're not told what the consequence was. I don't like to use this terminology, but they told him to shut up or something's going to happen to you. They had absolutely no compassion for this poor guy begging on the side of the road who was not just a beggar, but he was blind. They warned him to be quiet. Well, in the middle of verse 39, here's what he did in response to their warning. It says, but he cried out all the more. This just got him going. He cried out all the more. He amped up his cry to Jesus, and this time he shortened it. He just said, son of David, a term relegated to the Messiah, but again, the same prayer request, have mercy on me. So he, he just, no doubt, raised the volume of his voice. It's funny, you know, when people are told not to do something, the reaction is that they just want to do it. The other day, I came in the uh, lobby area here, and uh, some of the guys had just painted the, one of the walls, and it had a sign that said, wet paint. Guess what I wanted to do? I almost did it. I just thought, I'm just going to see how wet it is. You know, it's, it's like if you see a sign that says, uh, wet paint, don't touch, you go, you know, really? Now, I can tell you, when I walk in, usually I don't want to walk over the wall and touch it. I don't have a, a, a touch-the-wall fetish. But when I saw that sign, it elicited something within me that made me want to touch that wall. So when this guy was told, be quiet... Don't talk to him. Well, he just said, no, sir, I'm going to talk to him all I want. And he cried out to Jesus all the more. Now, in verse 40, this is so beautiful because, remember now, this multitude had come to where the guy was sitting. They were in front of him, and they were moving along. So Jesus was probably past him already, probably, but it says, so Jesus stood still. He just stopped. I love that. He just stood still. I wonder what those around him thought. Like, what's up? What are you, why are you stopping? And he commanded him to be brought to him. It wouldn't surprise me if the very people Jesus 
told to go get the blind man were the very ones who had told the blind man to be quiet. You see, Jesus loves to explain to people that, like us, that don't understand his compassion, he'll often use us, he, and I'm, let me back up, I think he wanted them to know, hey guys, you got the idea wrong here, I, do, I care about people, so would you please go get that guy? I, it wouldn't surprise me, and it wouldn't surprise me if Jesus let this whole be quiet business, crying out business, go on long enough just to where he knew he could then make an object lesson out of it. Because you see, the disciples, like you and I, and these people, and I'm assuming the disciples were in this little group here, uh, they needed to be taught about who Christ is and who God is. They needed to be taught that he cares about people so much that as the just one, the just died for the unjust. He wants, he wants to communicate to people that God is not out damning people as you hear people all day say he is. But rather, God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus was instructing them about who he was. Jesus wants to instruct us about who he, he is. So he stood still, he asked, commanded that the man be brought to him, and when he had come near, so that this group now and I'm reading into the text, if it was the group that warned him, they're now going over with red faces and said to the guy, hey, whatever your name is, yes, um, come with us, Jesus wants to see you. Imagine the joy in his heart at that moment. What? Yeah, come with us. So when he had come near... He's coming near and he's being led by these men because he can't see. When he got near Jesus, Jesus asked him one question. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, he used a different word now for Jesus. He called him Master, Lord, that I may receive my sight. It's hard for us to imagine what this man must have gone through. I just want to be able to see. That's all I'm asking you to do. He also believed that Jesus could do that for him. And Jesus was asking him, what do you want me to do for you? Then, in verse 42, Jesus said to him, receive your sight, your faith has saved you. Bible scholars believe that the has saved you part of that verse includes the saving of his soul. Not only did Jesus heal him physically, but he healed him spiritually. Sounds like Jesus to me because Jesus would not want to just heal a man physically and leave him in an unsaved condition on his way to hell. He saved him completely. And he said, receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. The words themselves tell us that in addition to him receiving sight, he had been saved, which ought to encourage you who, if you're not saved, your faith can save you. Not your faith, but that's the basis upon which you can be saved. Christ will save your soul if you ask him. The Bible says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you're not saved, you can be saved today. You see, then it happened 
that on the 18th of January, isn't it the 18th today? The 18th of January, you got saved. You didn't expect it, but it could happen today to you. Well, verse 43 wraps up the story. And immediately he received his sight. So, just like that. As soon as Jesus got through speaking to him, immediately he went from being blind to being able to see. And then notice what he did. First of all, he, well, there's three things. One, he received his sight. It was a gift from God, the gift of healing. Secondly, he followed Jesus, which means after he got his sight, he, kept, he started following Christ. Thirdly, he was glorifying God. So the Lord healed him. He, started, he saved his soul. He started following, which is another word for disciple, and he was glorifying God. Imagine what a story that man had. How hard would it have been for him to go to a guy, anybody, and just say, hey, I have something to tell you. What's that? Well, I was blind, but now I see. I think we just sang that song this morning, didn't we? That's our story. I once was blind, but what? Now I see. God is the one who's healed us. And then what we're told at the end of verse 43 is the effect of what happened in his life in the lives of people around him and all the people when they saw it gave praise to God. Imagine. Wow. Praise the Lord. And that's what happens that's what happens in your life as you've become saved. People around you see the difference. I was talking to somebody just the other day. A man I'm discipling. And he was telling me that he went and told his friends what had happened to him. He has a real testimony to tell them. Hey, I, I want to let you know what's happened to me. And I'm certain that as time marches on, those friends are going to see the evidence of what he said. You know, people can go say anything. Hey, God saved me. Well, now, if somebody said that to my wife, she'd say, well, let's wait a little bit and see if it's really real. I'm the kind of guy that if you tell me something, I go, oh, good. My wife's the kind of woman that says, let's see if it's really real. That's, so you can imagine all the trouble she keeps me out of because I, I just believe people and I get taken advantage of. That's my poor story. I'm sharing it with you here today. But anyways, I blame that all on my parents too. I want to throw that in while I'm at it. So that's the story. Short little story. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, for a moment. Ephesians, chapter 3. I'd like to just take a few minutes to bring some application for you and I from this story beyond whatever the Lord may have already ministered to you. But notice in Ephesians chapter 3, in the last two verses, verse 20 and 21, Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21, we are told something here about God. It says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. I quoted that verse once to a guy who has been a Christian a long time, knows the Bible. I was just quoting it to him at breakfast, and I said, you know that beautiful verse I read it this morning, exceedingly abundantly? He said, Bob, he said, There's, the Bible isn't written that way. The Bible doesn't say two words like that together. I said, oh, yes, it does. He said, oh, no, it doesn't. He thought he was real smart. And I said, well, why don't you open your Bible? It says it right there, exceedingly abundant. Only God would say it that way. God is able to do exceedingly. How would you even define the word exceedingly? And then abundantly. 
above all that we could ask or think. That's a truth about God. Now, that blind man, he had a problem. I'm not sure what circumstances you would put in under your heading of problems in your life right now, but would you just think a little bit with me for a moment and maybe make a mental list of the issues that you're dealing with that if Jesus were to ask you, what would you, what do you want me to do for you? It would be those things that you'd put on that list. You can put them in a little box in your mind if you want. Maybe you are in an adulterous relationship and you know you want God to help you out of it. Maybe you are flirting with somebody that you have no business flirting with. Maybe you are in a situation where there's great pain and great difficulty through no fault of your own. You didn't do something to get yourself into this situation. It just came upon you. Or maybe you did do something to get yourself in a tough situation. Maybe you're having difficulties with your spouse, your children, your boss, your co-workers, people that, are, that you oversee. Maybe you are having issues just within your own mind and heart of confusion and sadness and depression, anxiety, worry, I mean, you name it. I'd like you to just kind of put those in a little box for a moment and just think about them. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Is that true? It is. He, he did it for this blind man. You know, it says that as they were nearing Jericho, do you know that all of the Jews would have known that Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, right? No, they didn't sing that song, but you can sing it. Is, any, is there anyone who would like to come up and sing that as a solo artist today? And the walls came what? You know, Jericho, if you remember, when the children of Israel first entered the land, uh, pr the promised land, that was the first city that they took. Remember, that whole land was given to the Jews. But that land was inhabited by the Jebusites, the Perizzites, the Hittites, the Philistines, you name it. There was a whole bunch of people that were like the Islamic terrorists that you're hearing about today. They just as soon cut your head off as anything. They were evil, wicked people, and they were powerful. And here come the Jews, and God says, I'm going to give this land to you, I'm going to be with you, and if you'll just keep your eyes on me and do what I tell you, we're going to, like dominoes, we're going to take each one of these cities. Well, Jericho was the first city that they came upon. It, when we talk about the walls, the walls were big enough, they were tall enough and wide enough that you could ride several chariots side by side on the top of them, like a highway. They were thick, thick walls. And what God did is he had his people not even fire a shot, as it were. He told them, I want you to get lined up. I want you to get the priests. I want you to get the Ark of the Covenant. He told them how to get in this procession. He said, I want you to march around the city for so many days, just once a day. And then on the last day, I want you to march around it so many times on that day. And then I want you to blow the trumpets. And 
when they blew the trumpets, those walls came down. Now, I believe that what God was trying to teach them was this. I'm going to do for you what needs to be done. I have plans for you. And what you need to do is not by your might or your power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. This is why Jesus said, without me, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's why Paul said, I can do all things, meaning all of the things God calls me to, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. So one of the first things God was trying to teach his people is, look, I can do this for you. And it's a great reminder for you and I as we think about the problems we have that it's God who does the work. It's God who does the work. He isn't... You know know that statement? God helps those who what? What? Where did that come from? I think it came from below, the pit. I mean, if you could help yourself, why does God need to help you? God says, oh, I can see you're helping yourself. Well, let me join up with you. You look pretty good. Makes no sense. He actually, the truth is, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, hey, guess what I discovered? When I'm weak, then I'm strong. In my weakness, his, his grace and his strength is made perfect. So God isn't looking for strong people. He's attracted, actually, to people who are weak. Lord, I can't do this. And the fact is, you know what? We can't do life as Christians without a complete dependence upon God. And you know what? They that come to God must first believe that he is, just have faith in him, and that he is a rewarder, love that word, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Have you found that to be true? It's the truth. Look with me in 2 Corinthians to the left of Ephesians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, please. For just a moment, Walter's saying, when Pastor Bob says just a moment, he doesn't literally mean a moment. He has his own definition of a moment. It's a longer period of time than most people define moment. So if you look with me for my own definition of a moment in 2 Corinthians 4 for a moment, please. Look what it says in verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3. This goes to the issue of people not being able to see the gospel, blindness. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. What an alarming statement. Paul is acknowledging there are some people who can't see the gospel. It is veiled to them. It's behind the veil. They're they're veiled. They can't see it. And if they can't see it, you know what that means? It means they are perishing. What does perishing mean? It means that you are unsaved, you are without God, you are without Christ, you are without hope, you are separated from God, you are dead in your sins and your trespasses, and if you die in that condition, you will be separated from God forever. So that young man that we prayed for, he's perishing and doesn't know it. That's a terrible condition to be in, by the way. Now, from his perspective... He doesn't have a care in the world. He's got it all worked out. Verse 4 further explains this veiled business whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. So it's interesting that Paul now switches metaphors from not being able to see with the eyes veiled to the mind, he says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. 
Who is the God of this age? It's the devil, isn't it, and his demons. So what are they doing in the lives of unbelievers? They're blinding them from the gospel. Blinding their minds. The, the satanic activity is so effective that it causes an unbeliever to not be able to see the truth of the gospel. The reason that he blinds their minds is prevention. It's less the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He does not want them to see the gospel. That's why when you're praying for somebody, trying to get them to church, all hell breaks loose on you and on them. He knows that if a person who is not a believer can hear the gospel, there's a, a real good chance their eyes could be opened. And that's what you should pray for, for people you're praying for that are not saved. Pray that God would open their eyes. Now let me tell you, just because a person's eyes are opened and they can see doesn't mean they're saved. It only means they can now see what they couldn't see. They need to now repent of their sins and place their faith in Jesus Christ. Just knowing about God isn't going to save you, but you at least have to know who He is to be saved, and God can open their eyes. And I pray for you today, if you're here and your mind is blinded, I pray that God opens your eyes today in Jesus' name that you can see the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What question, what would you, how would you answer Jesus' question if he asked you, so that box you've got, that list you've got, what do you want me to do for you? What would you say to him? You speak, keep it to yourself. What would you say to him? You say, well, how much time do we have here? <laughs> I, got a, I got a list that won't quit. What do, you, what, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? Remember, he's for you. He loves you. He wants to help you. And in this story, Jesus was passing by. Well, he isn't coming out of that door, passing by, going out of that door. Jesus is here, right here, he lives inside of many of you. He's out in the foyer, not touching that wet paint, I can tell you, because he's never sinned. He's in the parking lot. He's where you live at home. He's omnipresent. So it's not like he's only passing by, but I will tell you this. It seems to me in my observation of people that people get certain chances in their life, if you will, where it seems like God is, is coming into their radar scope. And I would urge you, if he is on your radar scope, you grab hold of him. Because he might pass by. You keep hardening your heart if you are, you might harden it one too many times. Jesus said that. Do you know that we can pray a simple prayer like that man? He just said, have mercy on me. That box of yours, you could just say, God, have mercy on me. I love the story in the Old Testament. The, holy, uh, the holiest of, the holy place, the holiest of all, the Ark of the Covenant, that box. The lid on the top of the box was called the what seat? The mercy seat. The cherubims, the angels were there. Carved angels looking. They were both looking at the center of that seat because God said, that's where I'll meet you. I'll meet you on my mercy. So today, Jesus is here mercifully willing 
to do for you what you need in your own life. There were people telling this man to be quiet. You may be crying out in your life, and I would assume you are, for God to help you, and there may be voices or circumstances that are telling you to be quiet. It could be your spouse, it could be your children, it could be your boss, it could be the mockers that you have to work with, it could be your neighbors, it could be in your own mind that the devil is working in your own brain, it could be all of the things that you hear and see going on around you, the world that is imploding morally around us, promoting the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, those are all voices, if you will, telling you, hey, you be quiet. And a lot of people are buying into that lie, thinking, well, I'll find relief here. You're going to find destruction. You need Christ. He stood still. What do you want me to do for you? You know, um, I'd like to just take a moment here, quietly, as we end the service, and ask you to not do something. Okay, and then I'm going to ask you to do something. Do you know what a lemming is? I've never actually looked at a picture of a lemming, but they're like little rodents, aren't they? Does anybody know what a lemming looks like? What kind of a group is this here? I mean, I don't know, you don't know. They're just like little gophers or something. They're some type of a rodent, aren't they? Help me. Thank you. What, what do lemmings do if they see one lemming running off the edge of the cliff? They must not be very smart, right? Hey, there goes Lemming Joe down there. Come on, everybody, let's go. It's kind of just a, a herd mentality, isn't it? Not really knowing what's up. Well, I want to ask you in just a moment to express your faith to God in a very quiet way. And I'm going to ask you, please don't be a lemming just because other people would do this. Don't just do it because everybody's doing it. But I'm going to ask you in just a moment to express your faith to God regarding what, you, what your answer is to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? I'm going to ask you to take that box that's in your mind and as an expression of your faith to Jesus Christ, hold on, I'm going to ask you to just stand in just a minute, okay? By standing, you're saying, Lord, I'm asking you to have mercy on me. So a lot of people are going to stand in a moment here but don't be a lemming. Don't just do it because everybody else is doing it. But would you please stand to your feet right now in response to that question, what do you want me to do for you? Just if you want to stand to your feet. And I'd like to take just a, less than a minute to just remain standing Quietly, would you please in your own heart reflect on what God has said to you here today and would you please speak to the Lord in your own heart quietly. Let's just quiet our hearts for a moment.
Lord, these are the things that we're bringing to you. We don't deserve any of the gifts that you give us. But we, like this blind man, ask for mercy. May we follow you. May we glorify you. And may people around us, as a result of them observing what you do in our lives, praise God, just like in the Bible. Please be seated in a quiet way. And would you join me in another prayer? And would you please help me to pray by praying and repeating this prayer out loud? We want to pray for anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ, that they would give their lives to Christ this morning. And we want to pray for those who've been away from Christ that they would come back to Jesus. And then we're going to receive the morning tithes and offerings. So let's pray for the unsaved. Dear God, let's pray together. Dear God, I need to be saved. I admit I'm a sinner. I turn from my sins. I realize you're the Savior, and I receive you into my life, and I thank you for saving my soul. And then we're going to pray for those who've drifted away. Dear God, be merciful to me. I've not paid attention to you. I've drifted away from you. You used to be the main person in my life. But it's not that way today. I want to get back to just loving you and making you the center of my life. And then lastly, Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Just like you did in the book of Acts. Over and over again. Thank you, Father. And Lord, we ask that you receive these tithes and offerings now. And we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.